A resource-based economy is simply the scientific method applied to social concern, an approach utterly absent in the world today. Society is a technical invention, and the most efficient methods of optimized human health, physical production, distribution, city infrastructure, and the like, reside in the field of science and technology, not politics or monetary economics. It operates in the same systematic way as, say, an airplane, and there is no Republican or liberal way to build an airplane. Likewise, nature itself is the physical referent we use to prove our science, and it is a set system, emerging only from our increased understanding of it. In fact, it has no regard for what you subjectively think or believe to be true. Rather, it gives you an option. You can learn and fall in line with its natural laws and conduct yourself accordingly, invariably creating good health and sustainability, or you can go against the current to no avail. It doesn't matter how much you believe you can just stand up right now and walk on the wall next to you. The law of gravity will not allow it. If you do not eat, you will die. If you are not touched as an infant, you will die. As harsh as it may sound, nature is a dictatorship, and we can either listen to it and come in harmony with it, or suffer the inevitable adverse consequences. So, a resource-based economy is nothing more than a set of proven, life-supporting understandings where all decisions are based upon optimized human and environmental sustainability. It takes into account the empirical life ground, which every human being shares as a need, regardless, again, of their political or religious philosophy. There is no cultural relativism to this approach. It isn't a matter of opinion. Human needs are human needs, and having access to the necessities of life, such as clean air, nutritious food, and clean water, along with a positively reinforcing, stable, nurturing, and non-violent environment, is demanded for our mental and physical health our evolutionary fitness, and hence the species' survival itself. A resource-based economy would be based upon available resources. You can't just bring a lot of people to an island or build a city of 50,000 people without having access to the necessities of life. So when I use the term a comprehensive systems approach, I'm talking about doing an inventory of the area first and determining what that area can supply. Not just architectural approach, not just design approach, but design must be based on all of the requirements to enhance human life. And that's what I mean by an integrated way of thinking. Food, clothing, shelter, warmth, love, all of those things are necessary. If you deprive people of any of them, you have a lesser human being, less capable of functioning. As previously outlined, a resource-based economy's ground-up, global, systems approach to extraction, production, and distribution is based upon a set of true economic mechanisms, or strategies, which guarantee efficiency and sustainability in every area of the economy. So, continuing this train of thought regarding logical design, what is next in our equation? Where does all this materialize? Cities. The advent of the city is a defining feature of modern civilization. Its role is to enable efficient access to the necessities of life, along with increased social support and community interaction. So how would we go about designing an ideal city? What shape should we make it? Square? Trapezoid? Well, given we're going to be moving around the thing, we might as well make it as equidistant as possible for ease. Hence, the circle. What should the city contain? Well, naturally we need a residential area, a goods production area, a power generation area, an agricultural area. But we also need nurturing as human beings, hence culture, nature, recreation, and education. So let's include a nice open park, an entertainment events area for cultural purposes and socializing, and educational and research facilities. And since we're working with a circle, it seems rational to place these functions in belts based on the amount of land required for each goal, along with ease of access. Very good. Now, let's get down to specifics. First, we need to consider the core infrastructure, or intestines, of the city organism. These would be the water, good, waste, and energy transport channels. 
just as we have water and sewage systems under our cities today, we would extend this channeling concept to integrate waste recycling and delivery itself. No more mailman or garbage men. It is built right in. We could even use automated pneumatic tubes and similar technologies. Same goes for transport. It needs to be integrated and strategically designed to reduce or even remove the need for wasteful, independent automobiles. Electric trams, conveyors, transveyors, and maglevs, which can take you virtually anywhere in the city, even up and down, along with connecting you to other cities as well. And of course, in the event an automobile is required, it is automated by satellite for safety and integrity. In fact, this automation technology is in working order right now. Automobile accidents kill about 1.2 million people every single year, injuring about 50 million. This is absurd and doesn't have to occur. Between efficient city design and automated driverless cars, this death toll can be virtually eliminated. Agriculture. Today, through our haphazard cost-cutting industrial methods, using pesticides, excessive fertilizers, and other means, we have successfully destroyed much of the arable land on this planet, not to mention also extensively poisoning our bodies. In fact, industrial and agricultural chemical toxins now show up in virtually every human being tested, including infants. Fortunately, there is a glaring alternative. The soilless mediums of hydroponics and aeroponics, which also reduce nutrient and water requirements by up to 75% of our current usage. Food can now be organically grown on an industrial scale in enclosed vertical farms, such as in 50-story, one-acre plots, virtually eliminating the need for pesticides and hydrocarbons in general. This is the future of industrial food cultivation, efficient, clean, and abundant. So, such advanced systems would be, in part, what comprise our agricultural belt, producing all the food required for the entire city's population, with no need to import anything from the outside, saving time, waste, and energy. And speaking of energy, the energy belt would work in a systems approach to extract electricity from our abundant renewable mediums, specifically wind, solar, geothermal, and heat differentials, and if near water potentials, tidal, and wave power. To avoid intermittency and make sure a positive net energy return occurs, these mediums would operate in an integrated system, powering each other when needed while storing excessive energy to large supercapacitors under the ground so nothing can go to waste. And not only does the city power itself, particular structures will also power independently and generate electricity through photovoltaic paints, structural pressure transducers, the thermal couple effect, and other current but underutilized technologies. But of course this begs the question, how does this technology and goods in general get created in the first place? This brings us to production. The industrial belt, apart from having hospitals and the like, would be the hub of factory production. Completely localized overall, it would of course obtain raw materials by way of the global resource management system just discussed, with demand being generated by the population of the city itself. As far as the mechanics of production, we need to discuss a new powerful phenomenon which was sparked very recently in human history and is on pace to changing everything. It's called mechanization, or the automation of labor. Well, if you look uh, around you, you'll notice that almost everything that we use today uh, is built automatically. Uh, your shoes, your clothes, your home appliances, your car, and so on, uh, they are all built by machines uh, in an automatic way. Can we say that the society has not been influenced by these major technological advancements? Of course not. These um, systems really dictate new structures and new needs, and they make a lot of other things obsolete. So we've been going up uh, in the development and use of technology in an exponential way. So definitely, Automation is going to continue. You cannot stop the technologies that just make sense. Labor automation through technology is at the bottom of every major social transformation in human history. From the agricultural revolution and the invention of the plow, 
to the industrial revolution and the invention of the powered machine to the information age we live in now through essentially the invention of advanced electronics and computers. And with regard to advanced production methods today, mechanization is now evolving on its own, moving away from the traditional method of assembling component parts into a configuration into an advanced method of creating entire products in one single process. Like most engineers, I'm fascinated by biology because it's so full of examples of extraordinary pieces of engineering. Um, and the, what biology is, is the study of things that copy themselves. Of course, that's as good a definition of life as we've got. Again, as an engineer, I've always been intrigued by the idea of machines that would copy themselves. RepRap is a three-dimensional printer. That's to say, it's a printer that you plug into a computer, and instead of making two-dimensional sheets of paper with patterns on, it makes real, physical, three-dimensional objects. Now, there's nothing new about that. Uh, 3D printers have been around for about 30 years. The big thing about RepRap is that it prints most of its own parts. And so, if you've got one, you can make another one and give it to a friend, as well as being able to print lots of useful things. From the simple printing of basic household goods in your home, to the printing of an entire automobile body in one swoop. Advanced automated 3D printing now has the potential to transform virtually every field of production, including home construction. The contour crafting is actually a fabrication technology, the so-called 3D printing when you directly build a 3D object from a computer model. Using contour crafting, it will be possible to build a 2,000 square foot home entirely by the machine in one day. The reason that uh, people are interested in automating construction is that it really brings a lot of benefits. Uh, for example, construction is pretty labor intensive and uh, although it provides job for a uh, sector of the society, it also has issues uh, and uh, complications. For example, construction is the most dangerous job that there is. Uh, it is worse than mining and agriculture. It has got the highest level of fatality almost in every country. Another issue is the waste. Uh, an average home in the United States has three to seven tons of waste. Uh, so this is huge uh, if we look at the impact of construction and and knowing that about 40% of all materials in the world are used in construction. So a big 